OK, thanks for that introduction. From the early days of the cypherpunks 30 years ago, we've been dreaming of bringing the world economy online into a decentralized, permissionless world of crypto commerce. However, the way we've been going about it, the way this, the, most of this industry has been going about it so far, uh, has some show-stopping problems that we have to overcome in order to actually make realistic progress uh, towards the goal. So for one thing, the way people compose smart contracts, for example, on Ethereum, uh, is too hazardous. Uh, experts put a lot of attention into carefully constructing smart contracts, and then uh, hundreds of millions of dollars disappear overnight with no recourse. And this happens repeatedly. The smart contract languages are unfamiliar languages, and they operate in unfamiliar ways, uh, creating a huge barrier to adoption. Uh, in order for the economy, the complexity of the economy to move into this new world, the level of expertise needed to write smart contracts reliably has to be something accessible to programmers whose expertise is in their subject matter, not expertise in, their, in smart contracting. The primitives that the smart contracts are built out of are non-composable. So the smart contracts themselves do not compose well. Uh, and the result is that they don't form the kinds of rich networks of contractual relationships that are necessary to mirror the complexity of the real world economy. And with the exception of a few players like Cosmos, in general, uh, every chain is built as if it is supposed to be the only chain in the world. Um, uh, and then writing contracts for a chain, you're locked into that chain, also creating more barriers to adoption. So we want to overcome all of these problems. Our architecture is best understood uh, in layers. At the bottom is what I call the machine layer. Each rectangle here is a physical machine, but each stack is a logical machine. A blockchain, from our perspective, is a highly credible logical machine because it's built out of the massive multi-way agreement of many physical machines, where those physical machines are spread over different institutions, are spread over different jurisdictions, uh, so that uh, there's, there's no, um, no one party who can corrupt uh, that logical machine. And, but altogether, the, the, the world of these platforms includes public blockchains, includes private permission quorum systems, includes solo machines. Uh, so we're trying to build a system that supports a network across all of these platforms, chains and non-chains, public and private, etc. On top of this, we build our VAT layer. And the VAT layer, uh, the green rectangles are VATs. They're process-like units. They're a unit of synchrony. And VATs only communicate to each other asynchronously. And these pipes connecting the VATs, those are secure data pipes. Uh, and uh, um, uh, we are using IBC, in fact, for those secure data pipes. On top of that, we build a system of secure JavaScript objects using JavaScript as an object capability language. I'll be explaining uh, quite soon what that means. Um, but the overall uh, framework here is that an object can invoke an object that it has a reference to. And an object can have a reference in to another object in its own VAT in a conventional language flow, or it can have a reference to an object in a remote VAT, in which case it can send an asynchronous message that turns into a cryptographic message at the lower layers. And on top of that, we build our system of electronic rights and smart contracts. Uh, that top layer is sort of the point 
of all of these lower layers. And the reason, one of the reasons we layer things in this way is that assembling cryptographic primitives in a custom manner to express a contractual relationship is incredibly too hazard prone. There's a tremendous history of people designing cryptographic protocols badly that have subtle flaws in them. So rather than design new cryptographic protocols to express new relationships, we want to invest in that effort once to create a secure distributed object system so that our electronic rights and smart contracting can be in the symbolic realm of objects uh, that express the contractual relationships in this logical manner. Uh, however, the e-rights and smart contracts are still a distinct level of abstraction on top of that that provides its own compositionality properties that we'll see. These layers are connected by layers of protocol. Each protocol, the IPC protocol, is how the secure data pipes are built out of a network of separate machines, psychological machines talking to each other. The CAPTP protocol uh, is builds distributed object messaging and distributed object references with object capability security properties, builds that out of the IPC layer. And then ERTP is the electronic rights transfer protocol, which is a set of object interfaces that uh, one implements and uses in order to define new, electro define new electro kinds of electronic rights and in order to define new contracts that manipulate rights. Would the additional noise be coherent? That is a lot of additional noise. Ah, OK, very good. Um, and that loop there, I'll be coming back to that, but that loop is the duality of e-rights and smart contracts. And that's the key to the compositionality, is an, a, a smart contract manipulates rights, but a smart contract also creates new derived rights that, in turn, smart contracts can manipulate. But let's focus first on the object capability layer. So object capability programming is very, very close to normal object programs. Uh, normal object programming in a memory safe language already has a permission system in it that we don't normally think of as a permission system. Uh, over here, we have three objects that I'm calling Alice, Bob, and Carol. Uh, the references are the, are the thin black arrows by which the objects point at each other. And when the object Alice says Bob, Doc, Foo, and Carol, she's um, saying, one way to describe it is she's invoking the Foo method of object Bob with, param with argument Carol. Another way to describe it is she's sending a mes the message Foo over to Bob. Uh, now, Bob, in the initial conditions here, does not have a reference to Carol. And that means, in a very safe language, Bob cannot invoke Carol. Once Alice invokes Bob passing a, a Carol as a parameter, what's happening is Alice is both using the permissions she has to invoke Bob, and by passing Carol as a parameter, She's giving Bob permission to invoke Carol. So there's already a permission system at the core of the object-oriented programming paradigm we're all familiar with. To get from objects to object capabilities, uh, all you have to do is prohibit things that are outside the object paradigm anyway. That you have to say that this way of causing effects, of using references and, and invoking other objects, that this is the only way causality is carried in the system. And therefore, this graph of references 
is the only permission system. This is the permission system that you manipulate. And you manipulate it with the normal expressiveness of object-oriented programming. We're all familiar with how to manipulate this reference graph. Uh, now that we leverage that familiarity um, so that you can take the normal expressiveness of object-oriented programming to manipulate this reference graph for the purpose of manipulating the, relation, the permissions relationships in order to express security patterns. So we repeatedly find security patterns others think complicated, we can express with intuitive, straightforward code. We're doing this in SES, which is Secure ECMAScript, which is an object capability secure runtime for JavaScript. I've been on the committee since the ECMAScript committee uh, since 2007, um, uh, getting all the enablers I need in there uh, for JavaScript to support SES well. Now SES itself is standards track. Um, the wonderful thing about JavaScript as a starting point is it has a clean separation between the language, which is essentially purely computational, versus the host that contributes all the I.O. abilities. And these are the main hosts. Uh, on the browser, um, uh, uh, the current SES shim that we're using for security, we built in collaboration with Salesforce, and Salesforce is currently running a 5 million developer ecosystem uh, in production on top of that. Uh, also, we're collaborating with MetaMask. Uh, MetaMask has taken uh, Browserify, which is their the packaging system they use um, uh, MetaMask is the system that uh, people use to build user interfaces to distributed applications, primarily um, Ethereum ones, but it's... Um, uh, so they've taken Browserify, which is their packager, and they've created a plugin for it called Sessify, uh, such that they can gain the benefits of SES internal to the MetaMask system and keep things uh, isolated from each other when they should be. Uh, 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 solo server machines run Node, which is adopting elements of SES. Uh, embedded is devices, uh, which is in which the standards organization is based on SES as the basic JavaScript to, to uh, use for embedded, and of course, Agoric for blockchain. So now we're going to shift our attention to the VAT layer. We're going to start with multiple VATs on a single chain where we built this thing called swing set, which is analogous to an operating system microkernel. We call it the swing set nanokernel. And it stands between a set of VATs. So each VAT is a unit of synchrony, but the swing set as a whole is a unit of determinism. So each layer here is another validator of the same chain, and they're all running the same swing set, the same set of VATs in the same deterministic order. Um, and the, an object in one VAT can refer to an object in another VAT um, by going through these interfaces into the kernel and back out. Because of that abstract interface between the VATs and the kernel, anything that is an isolation mechanism that speaks that protocol can plug into the system. So we expect to be supporting WASM VATs there as well. Uh, there, the comms VAT is the special one that enables these things to speak over IBC to other swing sets running on other chains. Uh, so our technology is uh, chain independent and cross chain. Uh, the first chain we're building on, we're building as a Cosmos zone. Uh, we intend to be running on other chains as well. Uh, and we'll be using IBC as the data pipes over which we multiplex the multiple object references that carry the object messages. OK. Now, let's shift our attention to ERTP, the Electronic Rights Transfer Protocol. So electronic rights 
has, have a rich taxonomy. Particular kinds of electronic rights can differ from each other in the number of dimensions. I'll only mention two from this table, a shared versus exclusive. At the object level, when Alice permits Bob to invoke Carol, or, or in this case, this payment object, uh, Alice still has the, that permission, so Alice is sharing that, that permission. Whereas money, for example, is exclusive, um, and actually I won't go into the others. Uh, the point is that object capabilities are specifically the rights explained in the left-hand column, whereas e-rights, this new level of abstraction we built out of objects, covers the whole taxonomy and does it in a way that facilitates writing generic smart contracts, contracts that can manipulate any right that can be described by the ERTP uh, interfaces. There's another way in which objects and uh, smart contracts differ from each other, which is the basic object transaction is the one-way message send, whereas the basic uh, ERTP transaction is an exchange. An example of an exchange-oriented contract is a covered call um, in which, uh, let's say, Bob has bought a ticket from a ticket issuer um, the, and uh, finds that he can't go to the concert. He's busy that time. Uh, and Alice wants to uh, reserve, you know, asks Bob, uh, if I give you $10 now, can you hold the ticket for me in case I want to buy it from you um, uh, before Monday? So that's logically a covered call. This is the code to express it. The crucial parts of that code is those lines which escrow Bob's rights in the call um, uh, before the covered call exists as a contract that Bob can invite Alice to participate in. And that line which prevents Bob from canceling until the deadline expires. Now, the important thing about the covered call as an example, is it's a contract that unfolds over time. Every contract that unfolds over time creates derived value. These two chairs on both sides of the table represent Alice's ability to participate in the covered call as the one who can, who can buy the ticket, and Bob's ability to participate as the one who escrowed the ticket. Um, uh, Alice, until the contract expires, Alice, by sitting in this chair, is in a valuable position. Um, uh, we want to take that valuable position and turn it into a valuable, tradable right. Um, so the same mechanism that uh, creates the chair creates it as a chair issuer. And all of these rights, the ticket, which is specific, the, the gold coins there, which are, which are fungible, the chairs, which are specific, the silver coins here. Uh, these contracts are not specific to any of those rights. These contracts are generic. They can handle any of these rights. The escrow exchange was not written with knowledge of what a chair issuer is. Uh, and the result is that these very generic building blocks can be composed together in the same kind of higher order manner in which, uh, in, a, in a, for example, in a functional programming language or an object programming language, you can compose functions and objects together to get rich, rich expressivity. Um, and uh, now I'll take questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Nope, nope, not yet, not yet. Um, so uh, how did we do with respect to our challenges? Um, uh, we dealt with the hazard hazardousness by using this intuitive object capability model. Uh, we provided the familiar language of JavaScript through secure ECMAScript, the compositionality by this duality between e-rights and contracts, and we avoided the lock-in by being fully cross-platform. Um, okay, now questions. Yeah. I apologize. What do you see as a practical application? In the day-to-day -day lives of the engineers? Yeah, please. So my generic answer, I 
our goal, since it's about getting mainstream people to be able to get into the central market, is a programmer today who can build an app, a server app out there, a banking application, a trading application, whatever it is, you know, on this platform, I want them to be able to build it into central app. So the target is not necessarily crypto developers, it's the guy who's trying to set up a new website, uh, someone who's doing a ticket application for local venues, whatever it is, they ought to be able to do that as a, as a centralized app and make it available in large scale distributed fashion, let people replicate it worldwide, pick it up and use it and expand it to their own time. What's the benefit? Well, the, yeah, so, so let, I'd like to take that offline because we don't have a lot of time for, for our things, but happy to talk about it. That's really about what's good about decentralizing, there's a lot of good things about it, and the main thing here is we want to enable millions of programmers to be able to do that where it's appropriate. I'll, I'll, I'll mention just one thing in particular. Um, uh, right now, real-world contracts, uh, the underlying technology are, is prose written on paper for expensive lawyers and, and adjudicators to interpret. What came to mind was real estate. Yeah, so, the, so, so many of the terms of a real-world contract uh, cannot be automated. Some of them can. For contracts that can be automated or for contract portions that can be automated, we can drop, by, by, by having the enforcement mechanism be on-chain execution, we can drop the transaction costs compared to lawyers by at least eight orders of magnitude. And that means we can, we can uh, because, because lawyers are a lot more expensive than, than, than compute sites. The, um, so let, let, I, yeah. said, let's take this offline. Okay. There's a lot of reasons, okay. and they all go. They can all yeah. very, very deeply into okay. our presentation. Okay. Other questions. What's the sorry? What's the what's like the future look like now that you have uh, like Ethereum and they have their smart contracting um, set up? How does this fit, or how does this work? Uh, so uh, we, uh, this technology is not specific to blockchains. Uh, a lot of the architectural ideas actually predate blockchain. So there's, there, there was a pre-blockchain vision of smart contracting. But the, the key thing about the blockchain technology is some contracts and some institutions, money being the, the most, the clearest example, really benefit by running on a single logical computer that has worldwide credibility without prearrangement. And only blo blockchains are the only technology we have that can achieve that kind of credibility for a single logical computer. So contracts that need that should run on blockchains. Many contracts are local, don't need to run on blockchains, can just run on anything that's mutually credible among the small number of participants in, in a given contract. But it's simpler if they just run on chain that has high integrity in some sense. So if you could just run them on a blockchain, yeah, having that high integrity, you just be able to rely on it. As long as there's this blockchain out there that you can have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The story front is going to introduce a few libraries like for fixing a sign on and get all kinds of sample libraries to start the ideation around. Yes, uh, very much so. The what what. You know, what we're building, at, especially at the ERTP level, uh, is a rich framework so that just as um, uh, people writing uh, applications for the browser have rich frameworks like React, or people writing applications on Node have rich frameworks, uh, we're pl planning to provide a rich framework uh, and a lot of um, uh, uh, prefabricated contract components like the escrow exchange agent, these being highly reusable, composable components. So by having a, a and you know, various auction types, uh, various other kinds of derivative instruments, by having a lot of these components pre-populating the framework and having a good framework for composing them, um, uh, we're going to, uh, uh, most people won't need to write the deep components. Most people will compose contracts by composing these components and parameterizing them. Uh, how 
incentivize both the students to become you know, entrepreneurs um, and you know, uh, like to start foundations. Or how do you guys plan to do that? Speaking, uh, we have several plans. But, uh, I'm not saying you know, the thing is, so the main thing is they need to want to build the thing they're building and operate it, and and if, if they can if they can build that in a system they already understand and operate it, that's sort of a direct a direct value to a lot of the, a lot of the What's uh, actually available right now on the Okay, uh, we are at testnet. Our testnet is still in an invitation-only phase. Uh, we are making rapid progress, and I will let, uh, Dean, do you want to elaborate on that at all? Um, and, well, we expect to be at, we'll be at the uh, Cosmos Hackathon. Oh, right. Uh, for SF Live, so. Good. Uh, all right, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, you can. So you can Okay. Thank you.